Well, if you turn your uh, book, we're there in Psalm 23, and we usually read the, the whole chapter before. Yeah, but um, I decided to do it today because it's a short chapter as part of the message. Psalm 23, the title of the sermon this afternoon or this evening is Half Empty, Half Full, My Cup Runneth Over. And the reason that I named it this is, um, you know, one of the, the, the things that we need to do as preachers or as pastors is uh, one of our duties when we're preaching the Word of God is to expose the lies of the world, to tell the truth, not only bring the truth to light, but also to explain the truth and, and uh, admonish or persuade you or compel you to accept the truth of God's Word, even if we don't always uh, understand it or agree with it. And one of the things that uh, you also want to draw from is, you know, the things that God has put you through, the experiences in your life or the things that you have seen. And, you know, the majority of my young adult life, my early 20s, probably into my late 20s, it wasn't into the 30s because by then I was already saved and pulling away from that. But probably from the age of 18 all the way to about the age of 25, I spent countless, probably thousands of hours uh, listening to motivational speakers, reading uh, books on motivation, on self-help, on business practice, business principles, how to get rich, how to become wealthy, how to maintain the right mindset. And uh, you would go to these seminars or you'd go to these events and people would talk to you and eventually, immediately, the most common thing that people would do is label you. And they were like, depending on the way you spoke, they were like, oh, you're a half empty type of guy. You look at the cup and, it, you know, in a, in a cup, you know, you've heard the analogy, the cup's half full or it's either half empty. And people would say, oh, if you're negative, you're the half empty kind of guy. Or they would label you, oh, man, you're so positive. You're a half full kind of guy. You look at the cup and it's half full. But when we read the Bible, God says our cup runneth over. And so go there to Psalm real quick so we can set this up, and then we're going to go through uh, the message. But in Psalm 23, verse 1, it says, A psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And this is L-O-R-D capital. This is talking about God is our shepherd. It says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is obviously a very famous set of scriptures. You know, young children in Bible school in Spanish, English, all over the world probably know Psalm 23. This is one of the most quoted probably Psalms in the world. But one thing that really stood out to me is, you know, if you look at Psalm 23, 5, it says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Well, look, if you're in the, in the presence of enemies, you're in the presence of something negative. You know, these people are attacking you. They're your enemies. It says, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. So even though there's negative things in your life, God's giving you more than you, uh, than you deserve, more than you ask for. And what's interesting here is, you know, there's something that really stood out to me. Verse 3 says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His namesake. You know, how do we become righteous in our spirit? We get saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. So today we're actually going to look at how the world has lied to us and has tried to label us. You're either half empty, you look at the cup half empty, or you look at the cup half full, but the reality is if we're Christians, if we're basing our life on the Bible, we know that our cup runneth over. And then we should take that approach to our life. You know, sometimes it's going to be tough. Sometimes it's going to be uh, better. But overall, God's given us in his abundance, regardless of the trials and the tribulations and the persecution. As a matter of fact, it is completely uh, uh, in the opposite direction of just labeling you either all positive or all negative all the time. But the world does this because they want you to just be on one side of the spectrum. Everything in life now is so, uh, so uh, extreme. You're either a Democrat or you're a Republican. And my question has always been like, why can't I be something else? Or you're either uh, love or you're either hate. Well, 
God says there's a time for love and a time for hate. Or you're either, you know, this, or you're either, you know, you're that. Everything is even in sports, even in religion. You know, we're either all, we all serve one God or you serve none. You know, the Bible actually tells us we serve Jesus Christ. But, you know, we're going to look at it. So the first one I'm going to look at is we're going to look at people. The first thing they try to brainwash people is there's people that actually like being negative. They're a half empty type of individual. They've been sold that idea, the psychological idea that when they look at life, they look at a cup that's half empty. And, and the reason that they do this is for three reasons. The first one we're going to look at is media. And, and when I talk about the media, I talk about anything that, that uh, controls your mind. Uh, you know, today, nowadays, ever since the early 1900s, Hollywood created television. We have computers. We have cell phones now or smartphones. We have social media. Yeah, the younger generation has video games. And some of the stuff that's out there is just wicked. So, uh, you know, social media, video games, and who knows what they're going to come up with in the future. And I, think, I know there's virtual reality now. There's all kinds of, of avenues or sources where they're trying to control you. And usually, most of the time, the media is always selling you the negative. I mean, I remember growing up and we would play video games, and there was a lot of video games about uh, shooting people and war and killing people. Well, that's negative. That's a half empty type of mentality. You know, go turn to Malachi. That's the last book of the Old Testament before Matthew. Malachi, but I'm going to read for you Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18 says, when thou art, uh, in verse, verse 9, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 18, verse 9, but in the meantime, you turn over to Malachi 3, Malachi chapter 3, but in Deuteronomy it tells us, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of time and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so, uh, so to do. So the thing that I'm focused on here is we see that there's individuals that the Lord doesn't like that are observers of time, enchanters, uh, a witch, familiar spirits, wizards, uh, necromancers. These all use a certain thing, and we're going to look at that later. Uh, sorcery. Sorcery is a... Uh, uh, you know, I don't understand all the things about sorcery, but sorcery is a way to control people. Usually it's done through, through uh, drugs or some kind of uh, a way that it draws you in and it controls you and through music, right? Well, one of the things that we have is, you know, ever since the advent of television, I think that that's a form of sorcery. That's a form of witchcraft because what it, it's called television programming for a reason. They're there to program your mind. And if you look at the media, it's a very negative way of programming you. As a matter of fact, most media, I don't care what country you're from, is negative. You, you turn on the movies, and all the movies are usually about life and death. Uh, even, if it's a, if, if, even if it's feel good, 90% of the movies or the, the TV shows will have a negative theme before it's positive. It's never positive the way that the Word of God would be positive. It's just, it just kind of leaves it hanging. Um, you know, there's... They're always selling you on all the sin and all the wickedness of the world. And, it's, and why do you say it's negative? Because you would, someone could argue and say, well, they sell it as a positive thing. Yeah, but when you live out those sins, that's a very negative way to live life because you start to realize the lie that has been sold to you. You know, and uh, you, you see also, I mean, there's just, I wish I could spend hours on it, but we're not. But, you know, I mean, they, they talk about witchcraft on TV and, and the medias. They, they, they talk about aliens they uh you know people have the they do the uh, uh horoscope i remember in in, uh, in spanish when i was growing up on uh, univision they had uh this guy by the name of walter uh, uh, walter mercado and this guy looked i didn't know if he was a woman or if he was a man the, the name was walter but i know he was a sodomite and he was like this psychic who would tell you you know, your future and all that stuff. So it's always been negative. 
I mean, even the soap operas, I remember growing up, I watched, you know, I didn't watch them, but my parents, my mom watched them. I, I saw more soap operas or bits of soap operas in English. I mean, I mean, sorry, in Spanish and English, but I never, there's never any positive ones. The story ends positive, but it's always like two seconds of the story. 99% of the story is negative. You know, so-and-so hates so-and-so, and they're going to murder so-and-so, and they're going to steal so-and-so, and they're going to hate so-and-so. So you see that this all comes from, you know, that there's nothing new under the sun, what I mean is. This, the Bible warns us of this even back then. You know, there's been different forms. Before it was all of this. Now it's just done in a more subtle or uh, wicked way because most people don't know that they're part of a witchcraft or they're part of sorcery when they're turned on the television or they're taking all kinds of medication or, the, you know, they're listening to all kinds of stupid advice. It's just part of, part of how we live now. Turn to Malachi 3 and in verse 1 and we see here, Part of the prophecy that's leading into Matthew, but we're going to just focus on the last part of verse 5. But verse 1 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Obviously, this is talking about John the Baptist, and then, we're, 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 then we focus on Jesus. It says, And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in, for and as in former years. And I will come near to you judgment, and I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be swift, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against false swears, against those that oppress the hireling's wages, the widows, I mean the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not, saith the Lord. And so we see here that he will come to judgment against those that control or persuade people the wrong way. Because you see it's a sorcerer, and then it says against adulterers. Well, an adulterer usually has an influence. You know, if we, if we were to turn on the TV today, the world will tell us that it's okay to cheat on our, on our spouses. I mean, they just, that's something normal. And that it's okay to, to tell lies. Uh, you know, it's just a little white lie. Sometimes you have to lie. But that's not, a, not, that's not according to the Bible. It says, and against those that oppress the hireling of his wages... The widow, the fatherless, and the turn aside uh, the stranger from his right. And then, and then convince those that know what's right or are looking for the truth, and they sell them a lie. As a matter of fact, I don't trust the media as far as I can throw them. I, I've been involved in politics in, in my, my, a few years back, and I've seen how they will take an interview and they will just make up a whole other thing. You know, they don't even talk about the things that, that the interview had to do. I mean, they just basically sell you a lie. And so you have to see that the, 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 you're saying, Pastor, what does this have to do with cup half empty? Well, the fact that you're always being fed negativity sears into your subconscious, and then eventually, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so you're naturally looking at being a negative individual because all, all you know is negativity. See, if you're in the Word of God, you'll see that your cup runneth over. You look at life not as positive, but as victorious. See, because you don't even want to be positive all the time. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. We're not going to get ahead of that. Go to Revelation 21. Go to Revelation 21, verse 1, the last book of the Bible, the, last, the second to last chapter. And it says there, in Revelation 21, 1, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So this is talking about the events after, right? And I, and I, John, saw the holy city. This is the future. New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So this is very, this is great. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And that he that sat upon the throne, behold, and he that sat upon the throne, behold, I will make all things new. 
And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But, and this verse we use a lot when we're out sowing, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we see, why am I using a lot of the scripture that combines positive with negative? Because when at the final point is that my cup runneth over, I want to show you the balance from the Bible versus what the world is showing you. Now, right here, the, the point that I wanted to make with these, this set of scriptures, number one, he, in verse five, he says, uh, to John write for these words are true and faithful these are true and faithful words that we are going to be victorious but then he gives them a stark reminder he says look but the fearful what do they sell you on TV fear we're fighting the terrorists we're gonna go to war so and so bomb so and so so and this the unbelieving they go against uh, pastors they go against believing Christians who believe the Word of God and they, they don't believe what the Word of God says. The abominable, you know, the uh, sodomites are invading our country. These, uh, these sissy queers, these fags are going around telling everybody that this is a normal lifestyle. And the Bible actually tells us in Leviticus that it's abominable. It says the murderers, and murderers, I'm sorry, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And, and if you turn on the television, it covers all of this. Everything in here. I mean, you don't, and I'm not, you look, I don't think that you should watch television at all. I'm just going to say it up here from the pulpit. I mean, if you're going to turn on, it should be for programming, like, you know, you're uh, now with YouTube and some of the social media, you can find other preachers that preach the word of God. You can find documentaries on the Word of God or that are promoting a biblical viewpoint, but the rest of it is just garbage. Even these so-called Christian movies, if you watch them in context, and I'm not talking about documentary, I'm talking about an actual movie, they're always pushing a wicked agenda because it, you know there has nothing to do with the Bible. So you know, just just in short, I don't think that you should just spend the time doing that, but. You know, that's not here or there. If, if you're growing in Christ, that's something to move forward to. But the other thing that you should be careful is it can cause you to be negative because everything that you turn on is negative. It's negative because if it's not negative in the sense that it's telling you about death and murder and, and war and destruction, it's just stupid. And then stupidity, something that is unfruitful and vain, can cause you to just know that you don't have a purpose in life. And guess what? That's negative because when you come to realize you have no purpose, then in vain, then guess what? People are then depressed. And if you think I'm lying, just look up all the, the commercials that are out there that deal with depression. You know, people are so depressed, they're taking all kinds of medication to not be depressed when in reality they could just turn to the Word of God. You know, another area that we have to look at when we're talking about people that are half empty is where is all the lies coming from? You know, it comes from the media. But then also another area is politics. You know, and you're saying, why do you, why do you talk about this? Well, I think it's relevant to talk about the things that we're dealing with. You know, the, the presidential elections come in uh, in 2020. Uh, if you're following any country, there are, there's always an election for something. I think the, the city of Houston has set uh, their elections this year. But politics or politicians are the worst because they're always going to sell you the things that you want to hear. But on the back end, they're being very negative and they're causing a lot of corruption and destruction. Turn to Matthew 23, and uh, this is the part of uh, Scripture where Jesus gives the, 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 uh, the Pharisees and the scribes the woes. You know, the woes is a negative thing. It's, it's like a very stark, harsh warning. And in Matthew uh, 23, verse 13, he says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, Neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. You know, politicians go around saying that they believe in God and that they are voting and, you know, they're going to give you all kinds of godly uh, uh, legislature. 
but they don't they don't believe in God, they don't believe in Jesus Christ, and they convinced you that maybe you shouldn't believe in either. Verse 14 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. You ever been, I mean, I remember at City Hall, before every weekly session, they bring in a different religious group, uh, sometimes not even Christian, to, to lead with opening the prayer. And it was disgusting. You know, you saw like the Sikh religion and Muslims and, you know, Unitarians. And they come and they pray in the name of a creator or in the name of so-and-so, not in the name of Jesus. They just make, but they like the prayer. Oh, thank you. That was a wonderful prayer. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. We needed to hear something like that. What does it say? Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Verse 15 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Proselyte is a convert, but he's saying not a convert to Jesus Christ, but a convert to their belief system. You know, our country sends out ambassadors, sodomite ambassadors to other parts of the world to uh, indoctrinate them in this false uh, lifestyle. And what does it say? It says that we make them twofold, and when I say we, this country, makes those individuals twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Verse 16 says, Woe unto you, blind ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. He says, Ye fools and blind, for, it is great, for whether it is greater the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold. And whosoever shall swear by uh, the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether it is greater the gift or the altar that sanctified the gift. But who, I mean, whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and, and by all things thereon. And whoso, swear, whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. And he's saying, you just, you're, you're, you're putting your trust in the wrong things. You know, uh, verse 23 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought to ye have done, and not leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain a gnat and swallow a camel. You know, there's a great example of, you see these politicians, and they give to charities, and they give money to... to to uh, good causes, and you look, but the reality is what they, they say they are, their life does not reflect who they say they are. And it's a very disappointing thing when you follow politics, and, and that's what, what, what draws you to wanting to make a purpose in life, because you realize that the belly of that beast is wicked. It says here uh, in um, verse 25, says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse that first which is within the club and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. You know, you go to these events, you see all these politicians, they dress nice, they look nice, they smell nice. But then you have a, a guy like uh, this Epstein guy that worked for Disney who ran a sex trafficking ring. And guess who he was trafficking these children to? politicians and Hollywood and famous people. So, I mean, this is, and then what does it do? You, as an individual looking on that, become negative. You get an outlook in life where you look at the cup and it's half empty. I met a, an individual recently who told me he actually has a, a, a bumper sticker uh, on his, I mean, a, a sticker on his bumper that says uh, that he loves being antisocial. He says that he doesn't want to be around people because he lost faith in humanity. You know why he lost faith in humanity? Because he spent all his time doing this instead of looking at what God has given us. I, don't have lo I haven't lost faith in humanity because God says that we should go out there and save the souls of men and women. You know, I have a purpose and so does this church to go out there and lead as many people to Christ as possible and put, pull them out of the fire. So even though there's trials and there's tribulations and there's negativity, I mean, that's part of the process. That's part of what God has told us that we're going to, we're going to face if we do this. But politicians, they just, on one hand, it all looks good. But on the other, it's all evil. You know, you look at it and it's horrible. Like, let's go there to uh, verse uh, 27. 
It says, Woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Uncleanness. Even so ye are outwardly, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites! I mean, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And I say, and say, if it had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore. Ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? And I love this last part because, you know, it's funny. That's what politicians do. You know, I remember growing up and uh, when I first started getting into politics, one of the arguments was that, you know, why don't politicians, they love starting wars, but they won't go fight the wars, Right. But, it, you know, it's kind of that same mentality is here. They're like, look, we wouldn't kill any of them. We wouldn't do that. But the reality is they do. As a matter of fact, just turn on the news. I think, you know, we might actually be going to war with Saudi Arabia. Apparently, you know, there was a drone strike. Saudi Arabia is mad. Now oil's up, all this stuff. But who's going to go to war? Is Donald Trump and the Senate and the Congress and the, you know, House of Representatives going to go to war? No, it's the children of all the hard-working Americans that's going to go over there, they don't care about that shed blood because it's all just for the money. Well, what does that do to society? It makes it negative. It makes it not understand what is right and what is wrong in this world. You know, and the last, the last sub-point I want to make about being negative, so we get it fed from media, we get, it met, we get it fed from the politics, then we also get it fed from false religion. And false religion is going to fall into both, half empty and half full. You know, go to second, uh, go to Revelation 18, but in the meantime, I'll, I'll read to you Second Peter. And I could have picked so many things, but I just kind of focused. You know, we focused on sorcery for the media. We focused on on the Pharisees and the scribes because they're like the scribes were the lawmakers of the day. The Pharisees were the over religious, and you know, you kind of have politics, and it, and it spews over. It overlaps. You know, false religion and politics go hand in hand. You know, uh, these big false uh, teachers they hang around with. The, the presidents and the dignitaries of the world. You know, there's a pastor in Dallas at the First Baptist Church in Dallas, which is a very famous church. He's the advisor to Donald Trump. Well, I mean, that's like, an, that doesn't even make any sense, but that's a whole other thing. But go to, sec, go to Revelation 18. Go to Revelation 18. I'm going to tell you in 2 Peter 2, verse 1, it says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring, him, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And then you're in Revelation 18, verse 11 says, And the merchants of the earth, and by the way, Revelation 18 is Babylon being destroyed in the future. Many people that think, you know, including myself, that the U.S. is that Babylon they're speaking of because it's talking about the merchants, the people that, that, that buy everything. I mean, we buy everything that's made in China and in Bangladesh and in India. But just to give it context, and there's going to be a day in the future where the economy is just going to crash. And we're going to have, a, you know, the merchants won't be able to sell what they had. And this is talking about, this says, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stone and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and, of, and, and all thionine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and, mar and marble and cinnamon and odorous and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots. And the last part's what I want. And slaves and souls of men. You know, there's a time where even sex trafficking and the trafficking of slaves, nobody's going to want to buy them. Which is actually, I think that's a very good thing. But the thing that I wanted to focus on, I, I tied it all together because the media 
sells you on the negativity, but they make merchandise of you. They make money of you. False religions, they sell you on this positive thing. Or, I mean, uh, politics, they, 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 they tell you what you want to hear, but everything's negative. You're, nobody's ever happy with a politician, but they do it to make money off of you. And then false religions, well, they're going to tell you both negative and positive depending on who, who they're trying to please. Why? For money's sake. You know, we have a, 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 a false preacher here in Houston, a very famous one. His name's Joel Olstein. He does it for uh, uh, filthy lucre's sake. He does it for money. And we're going to go into that. So we have the, the half-empty type of individuals. The world says, look, you're either going to be half-empty or half-full. That's a lie. But there's those individuals that, that, that embrace that. I mean, I know more people that like being negative. They're like, you know, I'm just negative. I'm a cynical. I'm, I'm uh, tired of, of life and the world. I don't trust anybody. I never fully commit. I don't open up. I'm always guarded. I always have a wall. Where do we get these ideas from? from all of these things. Then there's the cup half full. This is where I lived most of my life. You know, there are people that just, I'm gonna be positive all the time. I remember I went to a sales training one time and uh, the uh, sales training by, it was a, by, uh, a man by the name of Tom Hopkins. And I, I mean, I can remember to this day, he said, you have to be so positive in life to be good at sales. He said, so every morning, he, this is what he told us to do. I am not making this stuff up. He said, you have to open up your zipper, your bubble, your positive bubble, and you have to climb in your bubble, and you have to close your bubble, that but, and it bounces all the negativity off. You live in positive, and so negative comes and it bounces off. Negative, and you bounce all the negative, and you're only positive all the time. Well, that's a lie from the devil. There's no way on God's green earth that you can be positive all the life. All the time, even as a Christian, you know, as we're going through trials and tribulations, you know, if you look at the people that are going through it, they weren't positive all the time. Elijah, you know, which is one of my favorite prophets, he, he killed all the prophets, you know, some 400 plus prophets. And then Jezebel says he's going to kill them. And he ran. That was not a positive response. That was a negative response. Now, you know, God took care of him and reminded him that there's not... There's, uh, there's still 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to bail, but it's not, there's got to be a balance. We're, we're, I'm getting ahead of myself, but go to uh, Psalm 19, and I'll read for you in Genesis 3. Well, the very first thing that ha uh, the cup half full people do is you get motivational speaking or self-help. I mean, there is a ton of books. There's a ton of guys. They all say the same thing, and it's really uh, a nice way to say that you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in humanism. Well, if you believe in yourself, then you don't believe in Christ to save you. If you think that you can get yourself out of a jam, God can't get you out of a jam. Genesis 3.1, this started in the very beginning. Go to Psalm 19, but I'm in Genesis 3.1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, the devil already lied to her by saying, you can't, didn't God say you can't eat of any of the trees? But he planted the idea of all the trees, right? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat it of it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And we see, we know the rest of the story. Adam sinned and Jesus had, you know, that's the plan that Jesus had to come into the, uh, to die for our sins. But why is that? Because the devil sold the idea to Eve that she could become like a God. That she could solve her problems herself. That she didn't have to rely on the creator, God Almighty, to do this for her. You know, most of... Uh, uh, my adult, like I said, most of my young adult life, I spent it listening to guys like Tony Robbins, uh, 
A.L. Williams, Sig Ziglar, Vincent Norman Peale, Og Mandino, uh, you know, Dale Carnegie, uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki. I mean, you name it, I read it. Uh, uh, there was a bunch of other guys, Hanson, and I mean, I can't even remember them all. I read and I listened to so much stuff. And after a while, you know, it really got annoying. But then after I got saved, it really got annoying because it's all the same thing and it all focuses on you. Well, that's the way that also false religion does it. And that's also another sub point. It's the same one as cup half empty because false religion feeds you both negative and positive, but in a very unbalanced way. You know, here's one, one example. Tony Robbins is probably the most famous motivational speaker of the world. You know, he, he's been around for something like 30 years. Uh, the guy has books and CDs. I looked it up uh, last night. To go to one of his seminars, the starting, the low package is like $1,200. The, like, the VIP package is something like $10,000 to go listen to him speak and change your life. You know, I mean, you're going to listen to him and he snaps and he claps and he says that you have to just do things and you're going to change your life. And, and if you look at one of his books, one of his most famous, famous books is called Awaken the Giant Within. Not, you know, God. And, and he always lies. I remember at first I liked him because he talked about God. But if you listen to him long enough, he always says, you need to just pray to whoever you, you consider your creator. You know what? We only consider one. God Almighty, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. It is the free gift that allows us to go in heaven when we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? That he is the eternal son of God. But anyways, Tony Robbins, I'm, I'm just going to give you the, the table of contents because I'm going to make a comparison. Tony Robbins' book, Awaken the, Get, the Giant Within, has four chapters or four subsections. It says, Unleash the Power. So number one is he's going to teach you to unleash the power. And then taking control of the master system. I guess he gives you a system and you're going to master the system. Then the seven days to shape your life. You know, with God, it's a lifetime of shaping your life, but you can unleash the power of Jesus Christ in your life in an instant. But I mean, that's, a, that's a whole other thing. And then number four is a lesson in destiny. But within there, when he says the seven days to shape your life, these are the seven days. Number one, emotional destiny. Number two, physical destiny. Number three, relationship destiny. Although he's been divorced twice and he has a, a, a lady that he lives with right now. And in 2019, he was accused, or earlier this year, he was accused of molesting and groping his coworkers and staff and people that went to the show. But the guy knows about relationships, you know. Uh, financial destiny. Uh, then this is the scary one. Day five, be impeccable. Basically says be perfect, which is a lie because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Number six, master your time and life. Seven, rest and play. And in there it actually says even God took a day to rest. Yeah, but God took a day to rest, not to play. But anyways, that's a whole other. So you see this. Now you say, well, what's the point of going through this? Just to kind of give you an idea of how similar it sounds. It's not exactly the same, but this is Joel Olstein's book. This is probably his most famous book, Your Best Life Now. Joel Olstein wrote a book. As a matter of fact, Joel Olstein says that he doesn't take a salary from the church because he makes all his money off his books. He also makes millions of dollars off his books, but, that, that, you know. Number one, first chapter, first section, enlarge your vision. This is Joel Olstein, supposedly a pastor of a church, <coughs> <coughs> not God's vision. See, God tells us that he has a vision for us, and our vision should match his will, not our will, right? But he says, enlarge your vision. Number two, develop a healthy self-image. Sounds very similar to fixing your physical and relationship. Says, number three, discover the power of your thoughts and words. Number four, let go of the past. Some of this doesn't sound that bad, but if you look at it in context, it's really scary. Find, number five, find strength through adversity. Number six, choose to be happy. The Bible doesn't talk, I mean, the Bible tells us that if I chose to be happy biblically, 
is to preach the whole truth. And then the Bible tells me that I'm happy when I'm reproached for the name of Christ. And then number seven, you have a hidden treasure. You have a hidden treasure, not, you know, that God provides the treasures and the rewards when you do his work. So you see that they got the same type of training. And, and I mean, we could go deeper into that. I'm not going to waste your time today. But it's kind of interesting how this works. So when you're looking at the, the brainwashing of, of the cup half full, you know, you're going to motivational speakers, you're going to self-help. Then the other one is the world will sell you on sports and feel-good stories. You know, you have soccer, football, baseball, and basketball, probably the four most popular sports, soccer being probably the most popular in the world. As a matter of fact, it's called the World Cup, very similar to maybe the one world government, but that's a, you know, I don't want to put it, but go to Psalm 19.1. The Bible actually has been dealing with sports or knows of how people look at sports for a long time and makes a comparison of how you should run this race, how you should be competitive, but in God's way. Psalm 19.1 says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to a race. See, he makes a comparison to a strong man in a race, but here it's talking about how we rejoice at, at the Lord, you know, and at his coming and at Jesus Christ, and we look at his firmament and his handiwork. Now, the world just focuses on the goal of the winning. You know, I remember, um, it was like maybe, I don't remember, five, ten years ago, I saw the speech, uh, Michael Jordan's uh, speech to be in, uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame. The reason I went to go see this speech is because it made it to the news because the people were shocked at how negative his speech was. This is what who many consider, in my generation, I grew up watching Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. I mean, I watched every game that I could. I remember that, you know, the first basketball game I ever went to was the San Antonio Spurs against the Chicago Bulls. I mean, I saw Michael Jordan play in the flesh. This guy was my hero. Like, this is who I wanted to be. I love basketball. I wanted to be a basketball player. Nobody ever told me the truth that a short Mexican from, you know, Mexico, 5'7", 100 nothing, Probably it was not going to make it in the NBA, but I believed, because I had done all this, that I could be a basketball player. Anyways, that's a whole other, talk about doing things in vain, but what was interesting is, you know, his speech was so negative, because the thing is, the one thing that he's talking about is, ever since he retired, the competitive edge has never gone away. He still thinks he can play basketball, he misses the game, he's so competitive, he gambles, he does all kinds of things, because he can't turn it off. And he was talking uh, about how he could still beat all the young guys and how nobody could stop him and it was all about him. The reason was his focus is on a stupid game where you throw a ball in a hoop instead of your purpose being in Christ. That's what makes you complete. That's how your cup runneth over. So even though he may be looking at it from a half full perspective, that he can still compete, that he can still do things, it ends up being half empty because he's all depressed and negative all the time anyways. He's so sad about everything. That's why he has to do so many things. Go to, Ecle go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. I'm going to read for you Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. Solomon is uh, talking to us here, and he says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. For man also knoweth not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. The wisdom have I seen also under the sun and it seemeth great unto me. And it goes on to speak about how the greatest thing is wisdom. You know, and he talks about how, you know, it, it has nothing... You're looking, he says, uh, I return us on the sudden that the race is not to the swift nor the battle of the strong. In other words, it doesn't matter how fast you are, how strong you are, how smart you are, if you don't have God's wisdom. You know, so they've been, God's been using that comparison because you know why he uses that? 
because people have been focused on sports as their god for a long time, as that half full. You know, people spend their entire. I I actually listen to Bruce Jenner. And if you don't know who Bruce Jenner is, look it up. Bruce Jenner is now what he thinks in his mind a woman. He goes by the name of Caitlyn Jenner. That's it, because he did a. He's a transgender. He's a basically possessed by the devil. He's a demonic individual. But I remember listening to him at a motivational speech in live, talking about how he went and he trained every day for the Olympics for the 70s. He won the gold medal in the decathlon, which is 10 events. And how every day he went and trained. And every day he went and trained. I mean, he dedicated all his life to this vainless, fruitless sport. And what did it do? Because he had no purpose afterwards, now he's all messed up. I mean, talk about the mental disorder you have to have to now think that you're a woman. You know, a great athlete now has become nothing because he, had, he never had the wisdom of God. You know, he never had has had the wisdom of, or, or actually been saved and then grown in the word of God. Go to 1 Corinthians 9.24. The Bible says, Know ye not they which run in a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Not Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That's what we're talking about. But we, an incorruptible, I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so I fight not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And we see that God uses these examples of like running a race or fighting you know, in a, in a competitive field. But he says, look, do it for the incorruptible, not the corruptible. Look, God wants us to compete, but for the heavenly rewards, the ones we're going to lay at his feet, the ones that we're looking forward to eternity, not here. They, they don't mean anything. I mean, I spent all those years watching Michael Jordan and screaming up and down for nothing. It meant nothing. I mean, he's done. It's over. He's never going to play a game again. He's never going to win a championship again. I mean, we could watch the highlights. It means nothing. It didn't make my life any better. It certainly didn't make his life any better. But it's that half full mentality. Hebrews 12, 1, but go to Isaiah 30. Go to Isaiah 30. I'll be in Hebrews 12. Verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed, uh, compassed, about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. See, God has set a race before us, but it's not the race that the world tells us. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus has set a race before us, but it's not the world's race. It's not that half full, you know, that Olympic gold medal or that world championship or that heavyweight title belt or whatever you want to call it. It's the race of, of life. Well, what, what is it for us? Well, first of all, we should find salvation, Jesus Christ. But then afterwards, I really think it's important to go out there and help others find Christ. That's a good race. I mean, think about it. It's an eternal race. And, it, and it's a long race here in our life. I mean, it's not an eternal race. It's a, it's a long race in our life because we knock a lot of doors. And guess what? You're never going to be done in that race. So just keep going. It's really more like a long marathon. And then the, the final sub point of being half full is false religion again. Because you get the, the, the false religions that are negative. But then you also get the ones that are positive like Joel Osteen. And Isaiah 38 actually warns us. 30 verse 8 says, Now go. Write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come and forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside, turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One out of Israel to seize before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon. 
You know, they, these are individuals that are going to the preacher. It's like if today the congregation came to me and said, look, we know you like the Bible, but don't preach to us the Bible. And then I ask them, well, what do you want me to preach? Just make stuff up. Lie to me. Tell me, just tell me anything that's a lie. As a matter of fact, just do it. Uh, says, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Just anything that has to do with nice things that don't talk about God. Just, and your sermon should just be focused on, on all the positive things of life. Well, but God hates certain things. No, no, I just, God loves everything. God loves everyone. God loves everything. God, God is, is great. Just, just preach that. Lie to me. That's what these guys are saying. That's the false religion. So then people go to church for two reasons. They go to churches like the Catholic Church where it's all guilt. You know, it's called Catholic guilt for a reason, right? People leave and they come to the, and they confess so they can feel better. And then at the end of the week, they feel so bad. They're like, well, I got to go back to church. I'm sorry, Father, forgive me. I don't know what else they say. I'm not a Catholic, but, you know, or they go to church like Joe Olstein where they're like, oh, man, everything's positive. That's right. I can do anything. I am great. God lives within me. I'm the, and, and, and you're like, well, wait a minute. God says that we're going to suffer persecution. God says that we have to endure. God says he's going to try us. He's going to purify us. What's going on? Because they don't want to hear all this. But for us, we go back to Psalm 23, and it says in Psalm 23, verse 5, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And so see, what I want to tell you today is that those are the lives of the world. We live in our lives as Christians. We have a cup that runs over. And I love that analogy, not only because it's biblical, but because if you ever fill the cup over, one of the cool things about filling a cup over is once it flows over, it actually flows over too much. And so, you know, a good example, if, if this was the cup right here, if you overflow this, so much water is going to come that it leaves a little bit of room. Guess what? You have to refill it again. And if you refill it again and fill it over, it leaves more space to fill it again and flow it over. You know, that's just one way to look at it. But it means that God has an overabundance of, but it's a balance. It's a balance because the Bible tells us that there's certain things that have to happen for you to have that, right? Now, salvation is out of balance because it's a debt we can never pay, but Jesus paid it all. Now, the walk, the spiritual walk is a balance because in order to have some of the joys in life, for God never forsakes you, He never leaves you, He blesses you, He gives you long life. You also have to have some of the, the tough things in life, like the trials and the tribulations and the, the temptations that you have to overcome and the chastisement of God. It can't just be all positive and it can't just be all negative. You know, it has to be all of it. That's how the way God created it. Proverbs, go to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy, and that's towards the end of your Bible. But you know, Proverbs 18.10 just says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. You know, if you run to the Lord, you're going to be in safety. But it doesn't always feel like that. Because the world will come at you. He says, look, you, you, I love that. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest me my head with oil. My cup runneth over Go to 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. There's a famous set of scriptures that says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is the lie of the half-empty, half-full, whatever mentality, whatever feeling you need to feel right now to make you feel good. Because some people like being negative. That makes them feel good. Some people like being positive. That makes them feel good. It says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly fit, furnished unto all good work. You know, your cup runs over because it has the half empty and the half full. It says here, look, 
It's profitable for doctrine. That's a good thing. You want to know the truth. For reproof. You know, sometimes reproof is not fun. When someone tells you that you're wrong or that you need to fix something in your life, for correction, when God corrects you, the Bible, you know, I had this thought and I'm preparing a sermon on it, but that it's a good thing to be chastised and not punished by God. See, when you're out of the will of God, when you're not saved and you're, you're punished, that's really bad because it's for your hurt. But when you're corrected, it's for your own good. It's like your children. Why do you spank your children? So, th so that they don't do it again, right? Son, don't stick your hand in the, in, the, in the outlet. Son, don't stick your hand in the outlet. Son, and you spank them once, don't stick your hand in the outlet. Now they know. Now they think of it as a negative, but really it's a positive because if he sticks his hand in the outlet, you know, that's going to happen, right? So it's better to, to reprove and correct so that you lead a better life. It says, thorough, and then uh, for instruction in righteousness, how do we live a righteous life? Well, we have instructions through the Word of God that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And go to 1 Corinthians 2, and we're going to close out. And then obviously this is for the eternal race, the eternal walk in life. Look, I didn't spend a lot of time in the cup runneth over because I gave you a lot of negative examples. I gave you a lot of positive. But in there, I also threw, the reason I read so much scripture is so that you could see that as I was making these points, God has a balance. You know, you read Revelation 18, I mean, uh, 21, and he's talking about the sorcerers but, and the liars, and everybody's going to be thrown in the lake of fire. But what did he say? He goes, uh, you know, real quick, he, he says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and there's no more tears, and there's no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former. You know, there's a balance. But these are the same people that some of them died for Christ. I mean, that's the truth. But their cup runneth over. Now they're, they're, they're witnessing this. They have a table in the presence of their enemies, and their cup runneth over. Look, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, and we'll close this uh, out. It says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom. This is Paul speaking. Declaring unto you the wisdom of God. Look, it's better to preach the truth, even if you're not really good at preaching the truth and what I mean by that, maybe you're not a great speaker, uh, you know, and I don't have great language. You hear me, I mess up all the time. Sometimes I have a hard time pronouncing, but I'm going to preach the word of God. But it says, I came to you not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the, the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him cr crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. There's the negative part of life sometimes. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for they had, for had they known it, they would have crucified the Lord of our glory. I mean, they would have not crucified the Lord of our glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Look, if we love God, now, Salvation is, you don't need to love God to be saved, but look, you're saved. This is the greatest gift that you could ever have. If you love God, you, you don't even know the things that he's going to do for you. I'm not trying to be all positive. I'm not selling you a motivational speech right now. I'm just telling you the truth. There's great things ahead for us if we love God. But in that, what did he say? Look, I did it in weakness, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the dem in demonstration of the spirit of power. Look, there's that, there's that balance. And we know Paul was thrown in jail. He was beaten. He was stoned and left for death. I mean, example after example after example. But the thing that we know is that there's a great vision and a great uh, goal for us, we focus on that and our cup will run over. 
And I, what I want to leave you today is don't feed into the lie of the world. The world will try to sell you all negative or all positive. They're going to tell you it's all about feelings. You know, if it feels good, do it. If it feels bad, don't do it. But you know what? Sometimes going to church doesn't always feel good because it's, you have to make a conscious choice. You come to church when you're sick or you're coming to church. By the way, if you're real sick, don't come to church. But if you're not, you know what I mean? Like you're feeling tired or maybe you had a bad day or you just got in a fight with your wife or I don't know, come to church. God's word will entice you. You've not heard, you've not seen the things that God has in store for you if you love them. So anyways, let's go ahead and just uh, remember, the world looks at things from a half empty, your cup is half empty or half full, but we don't even have to look at it like that. God says, our cup runneth over. Let's go close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach your word, Lord. And Lord, even though I did close on a positive note, I, I, it's not a feeling, Lord. It's, a, it's just the truth that we are victorious already because we believed on you, Lord, and that we have eternal life. But let us also be uh, aware that if we preach the truth, there will be opposition. And that it's not always going to be uh, sunshine and rainbows, uh, peaches and cream. But that there's times where we're going to have to just plow through it, work through it, uh, pray through it. It just uh, read in your word and, and memorize and, and learn how to fight that spiritual battle that comes uh, from being a child of God. And that we live godly, we shall suffer persecution. But we know that the end is better than the beginning. So help us to just focus on that expected end. Thank you for all that you do. Give us a good week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.